So, true to his word, Craig Murray has an article he's written about the horrible conditions Julian Assange is being subjected to, including being kept in a glass cage at the back of the courtroom. We'll cover the article in a minute, but I was wondering what it was even doing there to begin with. It turns out, as I feared, it is standard practice in many countries. I found this New York Times article from back in 2013 about the practice, particularly with regards to Russia, but it mentions other countries as well. And they talk about Pavel Dmitrychenko, who was a dancer charged with arranging an acid attack on the Bolshoi Ballet's artistic director. And also a case in Cairo where ousted Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi was corralled with other defendants in a meshed metal cage. And the article says, Long issued as prejudicial by American courts and by the International Criminal Court in The Hague, locked docks, either metal cells or enclosures made of glass or wood, are still common, not only in countries like Russia and Egypt where the judicial systems often face international criticism, but also in many Western democracies, including Britain and France. Critics say that keeping defendants locked up in court presumes guilt, hinders the defense, and often has no basis in law resulting instead from administrative rules. In Russia, it is standard for anyone held without bail, even those who pose little security risk, like the women from the punk band Pussy Riot who were convicted of hooliganism after protesting at a church last year. And they quote Sergei Kadyrov, one of Dmitrychenko's lawyers, who says, Sometimes you can exchange two words through the cage if the security guard allows it, but very often the cage is far away. It's a serious obstacle to maintaining equal rights in the courtroom. And the article goes on to say, The way defendants are portrayed in court, especially in political cases, can influence judges, juries, and global opinion. Shrewd defendants like Mr. Morrissey can also influence perception by turning the cage to their advantage, using it to heighten the sense of an overly aggressive, politically motivated prosecution. Which I guess is what we're doing right now with the Assange hearing. So they quote Linda Mulcahy, law professor at the London School of Economics. I showed the Pussy Riot videos to my first year law students. It's a global audience we're talking about these days with YouTube and the web. As soon as you put somebody in a cage, you begin to make the process part of the punishment. So for the other side, they look at Rick Woodburn, president of the Canadian Association of Crown Counsel, who's actually defending these, and yes, they have them in Canada too. People who committed various crimes, murder, rape, robberies, stabbings, shootings, are sitting five to ten feet away from us. Just five to ten feet away from us on the Group W bench. I have seen numerous times where accused people got out of control and needed to be wrestled to the ground. I am not sure what that does to the presumption of innocence. Well, at least in that case, it's the defendant's own stupid fault. I mean, it's not something you're forcing every defendant to go through like, you know, what you actually want. So there have been several rulings from the European Court of Human Rights criticizing these docs. Unfortunately, they stopped short of barring them entirely as a rights violation. But in Russia, they say, The Human Rights Court went the furthest yet in censoring the practice under virtually any circumstance, siding with two men held in a cage while on trial for armed robbery in the Russian Far East. The men, who were acquitted of the robbery charges, complained that they had been held like monkeys in a zoo. The rights court found that there was no evidence giving serious grounds for the fear that the applicants posed a danger to order and security in the courtroom or would resort to violence or abscond. Their placement in the cage, the judges found, was not justified. And these are in Australia as well, and so they talked to David Tate, a professor at the University of Western Sydney. All the evidence that we can collect suggests that it's prejudicial. And they say... Courts in France, England, Canada, and much of Australia commonly place criminal defendants in docks made of wood or a combination of wood and glass. In 2010, prosecutors filed an occupational safety complaint against Nova Scotia, one of the few Canadian jurisdictions that does not use docks. And this is Woodburn again. People throw things at us. They threaten to cut our heads off. They punch at us in shackles, out of shackles. They escape. Well, maybe I need better bailiffs then. My view is safety and security of the people inside that courthouse is paramount. No, justice should be paramount. In the United States, docs have been virtually eliminated as a result of judicial rulings, including by the Supreme Court. 
Some states still have courtrooms with docks, but many are historic relics and are rarely used. Instead, some American courts discreetly chain the ankles of a potentially dangerous defendant to the floor. Others require an electric stun belt, which can deliver an immobilizing shock, to be worn under a defendant's clothes. As a security measure, the International Criminal Court in The Hague puts the entire spectator gallery behind a glass partition. While defendants in mafia trials in Italy in the 1920s were held in cages, the modern use of docks in high-profile cases is generally traced to the trial of Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi war criminal who was held in a glass box during proceedings in Israel in 1961. Ms. Mulcahy said that docks seemed even more prejudicial in countries like England and France, where defendants' rights were otherwise well protected. Why on earth do we want to marginalize somebody who is presumed innocent in this way? In Russia, some courtrooms have floor-to-ceiling iron cages, while others now have glass boxes. Sergei A. Golubok, a defense lawyer based in St. Petersburg, said that each created a negative impression of the accused and made it hard for lawyers to communicate and share docs with them. There is a joke, Mr. Golubok said, that in cages, the defendants were like animals, and the glass cages are like aquariums, the defendants are fish. So I was actually able to find a study on this published in April 2011 in the Chicago Kent Law Review. It's almost 30 pages long, but I'll just quote from the conclusion. A comparison of three different traditions of courtroom design allow us to see the way legal values are written into the physical layout of the room. The right to consult counsel is best reflected in the French and U.S. designs that provide for co-location. The presumption of innocence is probably best represented in the U.S. practice of placing the accused at the bar table. The designs of courtrooms that place defense lawyers alongside prosecutors and cut them off from their clients, the English model copied in Australia, is not the product of immemorial tradition, but a 19th century practice that reflected the interests of the emerging cast of barristers. It is the worst of the three configurations for promoting lawyer-client dialogue, for preserving the presumption of innocence, and for signifying that the trial process is a contest rather than a conspiracy. In addition, placing the accused in a glass cage further undermines the right of accused persons to a fair trial. If placing a defendant in the dock at all is inherently prejudicial, then putting a defendant in a glass cage adds yet another layer of prejudice. This practice is likely to be ended when defense lawyers follow the lead of their Melbourne and Sydney counterparts and ask for the screens to come down and for dignity to replace fear as the key principle of courtroom design. So now let's go over specifically what's happening with Assange in this farce of a hearing. Murray starts off talking about his point of view that he had during the trial, and he said, Remarkably, therefore, from the top right-hand seats of the public gallery, you have an uninterrupted view of the top of the whole of the judge's bench and can see all the judge's papers and computer screens. Mark Summers outlined that in the case of Belyusov v. Russia, the European Court of Human Rights at Strasbourg ruled against the state of Russia because Belyusov had been tried in a glass cage practically identical in construction and position in court to that in which Assange now has. It hindered his participation in the trial and his free access to counsel and deprived him of human dignity as a defendant. Summers continued that it was normal practice for certain categories of unconvicted prisoners to be released from the dock to sit with their lawyers. The court had psychiatric reports on Assange's extreme clinical depression, and in fact, the UK Department of Justice's best practice guides for courts stated that vulnerable people should be released to sit alongside their lawyers. Special treatment was not being requested for Assange. He was asking to be treated as any other vulnerable person. Of course, that's what they should be doing with all defendants, but anyway. The defense was impeded by their inability to communicate confidentially with their client during proceedings. They could only talk with him through the slit in the glass within the hearing of the private company security officers who were guarding him and in the presence of microphones. Judge Dalek became ill-tempered at this point and spoke with a real edge to her voice. Who are those people behind you in the back row? She asked Summers sarcastically, a question to which she very well knew the answer. Summers replied that they were part of the defense legal team. 
Bereister said that Assange could contact them if he had a point to pass on. Summers replied that there was an aisle and a low wall between the glass box and their position, and all Assange could see over the wall was the top of the back of their heads. Bereister said that she had seen Assange call out. Summers said yelling across the courtroom was neither confidential nor satisfactory. I have now been advised it is definitely an offense to publish the picture of Julian in his glass box even though I didn't take it and it is absolutely all over the internet. Well, you know what? I ain't British, so here you go. It's right here on the screen if you're watching the video. If you're listening to the audio, it's there in the thumbnail. But yeah, I guess we don't even have a pretense of this being a public hearing or anything. Bereister said Assange could pass notes, and she had witnessed notes being passed by him. Summers replied that the court officers had now banned the passing of notes. Bereister said they could take this up with Serco. It was a matter for the prison authorities. Alright, now admittedly, I don't know a whole lot about British courts. But in American courts, and I imagine it's not really any different in Britain, the judge rules the courtroom. Whatever the judge says in court goes. So if the judge says that Assange can pass notes to his lawyer, that's up to her. It's not up to Serco, which I believe is a private company that they're actually hiring to secure defendants. So... Summers asserted that, contrary to Bereister's statement the previous day, she did indeed have jurisdiction on the matter of releasing Assange from the dock. Bereister intervened to say that she now accepted that. Summers then said he had produced a number of authorities to show that Bereister had also been wrong to say that to be in custody could only mean to be in the dock. You could be in custody anywhere within the precincts of the court or indeed outside. Bereister became very annoyed by this and stated that she had only said that delivery to the custody of the court must equal delivery to the dock. What the difference is between the two I'm having a hard time seeing. To which Summers replied memorably, now very cross, well, that's wrong too, and has been wrong these last eight years. Now remember when we started off, Murray talked about his point of view in the courtroom and how he could see everything on the judge's desk, so that's important now. Bereister gave her judgment on this issue. Now the interesting thing is this, and I am a direct eyewitness. She read out her judgment, which was several pages long and handwritten. She had brought it with her into court in a bundle, and she made no amendments to it. She had written out her judgment before she heard Mark Summers speak at all. And she was reiterating points that had been responded to, like he could shout out, or she had seen him pass notes, or she was willing to adjourn the court, as we said, for Assange to go discuss things with his lawyers in the cells, which of course would be bugged. And then we get to a part that I can really only describe as psychopathic. Bereister said that none of the psychiatric reports she had before her stated that it was necessary for Assange to leave the armored dock. As none of the psychiatrists had been asked that question, and very probably none knew anything about courtroom layout, that is scarcely surprising. I have been wondering why it is so essential to the British government to keep Assange in that box, unable to hear proceedings or instruct his lawyers in reaction to evidence, even when counsel for the U.S. government stated they had no objection to Assange sitting in the well of the court. And so he quotes Professor Michael Kopelman, Mr. Assange shows virtually all the risk factors which researchers from Oxford have described as prisoners who either suicide or make lethal attempts. I am as confident as a psychiatrist can ever be that, if extradition to the United States were to become imminent, Mr. Assange would find a way of suiciding. The fact that Kopelman does not, as Bereister said, specifically state that the armored glass box is bad for Assange, reflects nothing other than the fact that he was not asked that question. Any human being with the slightest decency would be able to draw the inference. Bereister's narrow point that no psychiatrist had specifically stated he should be released from the armored box is breathtakingly callous, dishonest, and inhumane. Almost certainly no psychiatrist had conceived she would determine on enforcing such torture. So why is Bereister doing it? 
I believe that the Hannibal Lecter-style confinement of Assange, this intellectual computer geek, which has no rational basis at all, is a deliberate attempt to drive Julian to suicide. He is brought handcuffed and under heavy escort to and from his solitary cell to the armored dock via an underground tunnel. In these circumstances, what possible need is there for him to be strip and cavity searched continually? Why is he not permitted to have his court papers? Most telling for me was the fact that he is not permitted to shake hands or touch his lawyers through the slit in the armored box. They are relentlessly enforcing the systematic denial of any basic human comfort. They are ensuring the continuation of the extreme psychological effects from isolation of a year of virtual solitary confinement. A tiny bit of human comfort could do an enormous amount of good to his mental health and resilience. They are determined to stop this at all costs. They are attempting to make him kill himself or create in him the condition where his throttling death might be explained away as suicide. This is also the only explanation that I can think of for why they are risking the creation of such obvious mistrial conditions. Dead people cannot appeal. That Bereister is acting under instruction seems to me certain. She has been desperate throughout the trial to seize any chance to deny any responsibility for what is happening to Julian. She has stated that she has no jurisdiction over his treatment in prison, and even when both defense and prosecution combined to state it was normal practice for magistrates to pass directions or requests to the prison service, she refused to accept it was so. Bereister is plainly attempting psychologically to distance herself from any agency in what is being done. To this end, she has made a stream of denials of jurisdiction or ability to influence events. And this is what we see from state cultists all the time. I mean, it's all about, oh, well, I was only following orders. Well, it's not my decision. I'm just not in a position to do anything. And so what that does, as we've discussed, is it kind of spreads out the culpability people don't really feel like the whole responsibility for what's going on weighs on their shoulders because it's divided around so many others. And not to invoke Godwin's law or anything, but that's how you can have things like Nazi Germany, where you can have all these soldiers, you know, taking Jews off to concentration camps and doing stuff like that. None of them felt that the entire weight of all of those horrors fell on their shoulders because they were just following orders, right? So it's the same thing. If you work for the government, you have to have some way of distancing yourself from the horrors that you are participating in. And we see this all the time, from school teachers to welfare workers, most of whom are perfectly well-intentioned, but they either turn a blind eye and stay in denial of the horrors that they're doing, or they think that they're not the ones doing it, they're helpless to do anything about it, and what they're doing is just trying to create as much benefit from it all as they can. And that's how they get you, people. That's how they get you. The moments when she looks most content listening to the evidence are those when prosecution counsel James Lewis argues that she has no decision to make but to sign the extradition because it is in good form and that Article 4 of the treaty has no legal standing. Yep, there's no pressure on you. There's no culpability on you. There's no responsibility you have to have. We'll just remove all of this from you. And Murray concludes, I think there is a corner of the mind of this daughter of dissidents from apartheid that rejects her own role in the torture of Assange and is continually urging, I had no choice. I had no agency. I am a good Dalek. I am only following orders. Give me orders. I must obey. Those who succumb to do evil must find what internal comfort they may. Well, hopefully between now and May 18th when the trial resumes, things can be a little better and maybe they can actually get a psychiatrist to say, hey, don't put him in the cage. Let him sit with his counsel. Let him have human contact. Stop with the strip searching already. It's not necessary. And maybe they can figure out other ways where Judge Dalek won't be able to worm her way out of culpability on this. And I mean, here's hoping. I mean, we know it's a circus. We know it's a kangaroo court. But there's always the chance, right? I mean, his defense lawyers don't seem to be giving up, so that's good. As for the rest, I guess time will tell.
Until next time, stay strong and be free.